Okay. Hello and welcome to our eTail on-site search webinar. I'm Kelly Hushin, editor of the eTail blog, and I'll be moderating today's discussion. We're, del we're delighted to have you here and especially delighted to welcome our presenters, Jack Kiefer, President and CEO of BabyAge.com, and Dan Burstein, Editorial Director of Marketing Sherpa. Welcome, guys. Thanks, Kelly. Thank you very much. All right, so we're going to start off today with an introduction from Dan, who will set the stage for why we're here, what this on-site search thing is all about, and uh, just kind of get us ready for the presentation. Dan oversees all editorial content coming from the Marketing Experiments and Marketing Sherpa brands. He has 10 years of experience in copywriting, editing, internal communication, sales enablement, and marketing communication. Thanks for being here, Dan. Thanks, Kelly. All right, now, thanks for I, Oh, I'm sorry, Dan. I just wanted to say uh, before I hand it over to you, to, I just want to remind our audience that we welcome your input throughout, and we hope you'll ask questions of our presenters. You can do so by typing questions in the control panel of your GoToWebinar software on the right-hand side, and we'll try to get through as many of these as possible. And with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to you, Dan. All right. Thanks a lot, Kelly. Another way you can uh, communicate with us is by using the hashtag eTail events on Twitter. Uh, we found that uh, webinars in the past we've done through Marking Sherp and also Marking Experiments, Twitter's great because it gives not only you a chance to interact with us, but also you a chance to interact with each other. We found on these types of calls there's all different levels of marketers, some who are very advanced, some who are just entry level, so it gives you a chance to have that back and forth. But you can also use, use hashtag eTel events to interact with us and ask us any questions you might have. We'd love to hear them. So as Kelly said, I'm the editorial director for Mech Labs. We have two main brands you might have heard of, Marketing Experiments and Marketing Sherpa. Through Marketing Experiments, we do our own research with our research partners about our optimization methodologies, but I'm mostly going to talk to you today from the Marketing Sherpa brand, where we do research basically about you. We're trying to look and find out what high-performing marketers are doing out there in the space, and we do that through conducting uh, extensive research by asking lots of different marketers what they're doing, and also through our reporting, where we report on case studies. So first, I want to share some of our research about what marketers and consumers are telling us about on-site search. Then Jack, he's I got a phenomenal uh, case study he's going to tell us. Jack is one of your peers and a high-performing peer at that. So you can hear directly from a marketer that was uh, using, implementing on-site search on a site. And then after that, we've got a few creative practices that I've put together from our marketing trip reporting just to give you some ideas about what else you can do with your on-site search and see what kind of results you have. So let's start with the research. So. As you can see from this chart, this is from our e-commerce benchmark report. We put out benchmark reports on all sorts of different topics, but this one's about e-commerce. And you can see that about 23% of marketers have told us that they are trying to optimize and customize their internal search results. And you can see they look at it as a pretty high-performing tactic. It's, it's second really only to perpetual shopping cart on a site for being very effective at converting consumers. Now why is that? Well, 43% of consumers turn to a website's internal search box when they're looking for products. And it's the most popular consumer navigation tool on a site. Yet, when we asked only 52% 52, 52 of marketers rated their internal search as a D or an F, something this important. And it is that important because the customers who use that search box on e-commerce sites, they convert at nearly three times the rate of general browsers. So that's what we're here to talk about today. That's why it's so important. And that's why we brought Jack on too to uh, talk about his personal case study. So with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Kelly, and then I look forward to hearing what Jack has to say. Great. Okay, so I think that's a, a great point to just do a quick poll to the audience because we want to, um, we want to see what you guys all think about this, and, and I think, uh, Dan, what you just said uh, makes a good point. wanted to um, hear what everybody has to say about on-site search, how important they find it. So I'm going to just do this quick poll now. And we're going to see what everybody thinks. All right, so it seems like the results are rolling in. A lot of people think it's very important. It seems like that middle answer is uh, coming in, or the, the second answer, rather, is coming in at the highest. Very important, certainly up there. About 58% of people are saying that. All right, well, that's interesting. It looks like we have uh, the majority of people in the audience think that uh, e-commerce um, revenue, that, that the uh, site search is, is very important in e-commerce revenue. 
All right, so. That's great, that's great, Kelly. That ties very nicely into what we're just showing from our marketing Sherpa research. That while it's very important, it's really high up there, there are some things that marketers see more important, such as a perpetual shopping cart. Right, exactly. Okay, so I think that's a great point to turn it over to Jack. Jack, we, we're anxious to hear from you and, and hear about your case study. Um, we, you, we know you're going to talk a little bit about what babyage.com has done. And um, so we were anxious to uh, hear what you have to say, Jack. So prior to August of 2010, I would have rated the babyage.com internal site search as B. And, uh, what we've done over the past six months is really take a comprehensive look at what's available. And we're going to go through and spend a few minutes just explaining the process that I went through and, and to give us uh, some, some numbers to demonstrate the performance increase that we've seen. Sorry, Jack. So I just wanted to, uh, to jump in. I, we're not seeing your screen. Okay. Do we see ah. it now? Yes, we do. There we go. So okay, a great. little bit about baby, a little bit about babyh.com. We're we're a 12, 13 year old e-commerce retailer, um, right around the 30 million dollar sales range. Most of what we do is technology led. Um, we stock most of our own merchandise. We've written all of our own software, and we compete in a very fragmented market. But we do have some pretty big competition, like Babies or Us, Cypress.com, and Amazon. Typically, our distribution center is the best physical manifestation um, to describe how we go at process. So when we went through and optimized our, our warehouse, we optimized every square inch. We looked at the most efficient ways to do that. And that's the same way that we take a look at technology. So currently, all of our back-end operations are software that, that was written in-house. And for a period of time, we believe that we could write search on our own. When we look at our core customers, that's another challenge that we have at Baby H is that we sell them to multiple constituent groups. So we've got grandparents, new parents, friends, family members, and when you think about search in its, its very purest form, everybody comes to the site, they get one search, they get one set of results, and it's kind of a one-size-fits-all. And that's where we are currently. But I know in, in looking at some of the marketing Sherpa research and what's really going online with personalization, that where we're at right now is just the baseline of where we need to be in the future. Because if you think about a new mom and search, when she goes through and searches for a product, she wants to make sure that she gets comprehensive information. She wants to make sure that the shopping experience feels right. As opposed to a gift giver, they just want to have a transaction. And transaction versus shopping is completely different. So some of the site issues that we have. Um, site search has always been a top performing page on the babyh.com site, but we knew it could be better. Over a period of about two and a half years, we continually refined our code but what we found was that it just became too much of an overhead, whether it was from the standpoint of bandwidth or CapEx from hardware or just time and effort or our merchandisers. So there, we just didn't have the internal resources. And to put it in perspective from a staffing standpoint, Baby H has 23 professionals. The rest of the employees of the company are call center and warehouse. And of the 23 professionals, we've got three full-time and an IT. So perspective is, a, is an important part of this decision. For those companies who are smaller from a resource standpoint, you may have different criteria to make your decision. And for those that are larger, there might also be additional criteria. So the way we started off is in 98, we wrote our own search. And we did that for a while. Then we moved into a third-party package called Celebros. We were there for quite some time, and we kind of struck out. And then we made a decision. We had to do something different after we switched back to our internal search. And some of the biggest problems were that the search load time was three to four seconds. And we had to manually come up with our synonym table, and we had to manually do our misspelling. And it's just it's mind-numbing now that we've got a new commercial search package in 
to see how much revenue that we were actually losing by not staying on top of this. And on top of that, just the, the continued um, CapEx budget that we would have had to invest to keep our own search up and running. We ended up selecting Google Commerce Search. And for years, I'd been following the Google Mini and uh, the Google Appliance. But the problem was that it was still too much Google and not enough commerce. Uh, I read an article in late July, which kind of led me back to see that Google had launched this new commerce search platform. And one of our big pushes in late 2010 into 2011 is to come up with cloud-based solutions. Because again, availability and, and load time, everybody knows how Akamai, what that does to your conversion on your website. So we wanted to make sure uh, that we had a cloud solution. Because we're also trying to contemplate how we're going to address our mobile site. So the closer you get your content to the people who are using it, the better the speed. And then additionally, in May, um, there were lots of articles coming out about Google Caffeine, which is a new standard published by Google. And from my reading of it, they're going to start to grade sites based on the speed. So I haven't seen any correlation yet to speed increase and better natural results, but I wouldn't doubt that that's, not, that that's coming in the future. And then the other real interesting part that I found about Google is that it was a quick and easy integration. Um, and I'll go more into detail on that. And then lastly, I mean, I know it's kind of cheesy, but let's call it duck a duck. Who knows search better than Google? So from the standpoint of implementation, through my career, I've done I don't know, probably about 25 to 30 large commercial software implementations. And there was one in 1995 that almost put our company out of business. So all of you have been through a commercial implementation. You know it takes three to six months to plan it. And even with all the planning that you do, you cross your fingers and you hope you don't crash your site. So the first conversation that I had with Google was on July 22nd. And we had initial con uh, contract conversation. The following day, we received sample code. And because my developers were excited about the new opportunity and they didn't want to continue to have to maintain our old legacy search, they spent the weekend in trying to implement the Google, the Google Commerce search. So when we got around to Monday, we finished the implementation. By day five, we had a couple of conversations with Google. And by day six, we had the product running live. So from first conversation to launch was a six-day process. So some of the big areas right out of the gate that we had benefits were from was that misspellings. So Brightex is one of our top brands. But the problem was that we weren't even evaluating our logs, capturing all the different iterations of how our customers were searching for the word Brightex. So right out of the gate, that was a benefit. And our search started to increase in conversion. The next is, in Google, you have the, the infinite ability to configure facets. So what that means is any attribute that you have on a particular subcategory, you can define as a facet. So in the case of strollers, we have different um, functionalities or facets three-wheel, double and triple, full. But those facets are different in car seats. So we can call these facets out differently in different subcategories. And that was something that we couldn't do in our legacy search. Another interesting area that was a, a benefit for us is lots of our new moms like to shop by style. So camouflage is actually one of, was last year one of our top selling styles. And with this new search, you can search by camouflage, which is an attribute across multiple subcategories. So this was a really interesting new twist uh, that we weren't able to successfully implement in our own search. So some of the things, um, I, I don't want to come out swinging and seeming like um, uh, a, Google, a Google advocate. So what I wanted to do was kind of point out some of the areas that, that where I think the implementation fell a little bit short. So what Google does is they give you a control panel. And that's how you can control your search. But the challenge is right now 
that there's only one login for that search. And that one login has full administrative rights. So if you wanted to have a merchant login, in theory, they could screw everything up by hitting the wrong button. So that's a problem that we've raised and we, we'd like to have Google do something. And one of the reasons why merchants would need to log into this control panel is to work on promotions or boost individual results. So with the way Google has it set up right now, you can take their default return. So if you were to search the word Brightax, it would just be their own default sort. Or you could put a default sort in by best seller, highest price to lowest price. But our merchants like to also introduce new products higher up in the search. I believe we now have an API way to handle this through our own back-end software. So this is less of an issue now than it was uh, a month and a half ago. But there are also some synonyms, uh, especially industry-specific synonyms that our merchants have to set up. And uh, we also have to set up promotions. So we've kind of come up with some workarounds. But that, that's an area where their interfaces could be better matriculated. Currently, reporting is limited. And um, they do have a tie into Google Analytics, although there's still some parts that I'd like to see better reporting on. So again, to kind of summarize that, the, the, the access is limited because you only have one user. Um, reporting is limited, although you get everything that you need. And if you use Google Analytics, uh, the reporting comes in seamlessly. And the merchandising tools are effective but not exhaustive. And we just got notice uh, probably two days ago that there's uh, a fairly significant upgrade to their API. So that, that may change some of, these con uh, some of these comments. So to give you a perspective on some of the results, because really the money's in, in the results. And to give you an idea of the, the date set that I analyzed, I went from August 1st to December 31st, and I did a year-over-year -year comparison. So high level on the search results. Our search page views were up on 44.4% traffic. And the reason why that's fairly significant is that our overall site traffic was down by about 20% because we've made a concerted effort to cut back on CPC and shopping comparison. And then when you look at another big number, all of us know that, that the holy grail number to configure an e-commerce is site conversion. And our site conversion over that period of time was up by 24.1%. Now, again, not all of that was related to the implementation of our new site search, but a large majority of that was. And then there's kind of this unintended or inconsequential, well, not inconsequential, but unintended benefit. Because you use your Google Shopping feed as the main feed for your search, our Google Shopping feed, our Google Products feed, was whitelisted. And by having a whitelisted feed in our particular vertical market, it increased our revenue by an astounding 80.4%. And our conversion in Google Products was increased by 73.3%. And to put it in perspective, that increase was in the hundreds of thousands of dollars and just taking contribution margin, we more than paid over six months for the entire two and a half year contract of this software in the increase in Google products alone. Now Google's very clear to say that that's not a part of what they do. This is just um, a benefit that we received because we were whitelisted. And I'm sure if every single one of my competitors went out and did this, that we would probably see less of a benefit. But in looking at an ROI perspective, I was able to fully pay for a two and a half year contract in six months worth of usage. So in a smaller company <clears throat> where we really focus on CapEx and making any purchase that we make have to conform to certain profitability guidelines, uh, this is pretty much, this was a no brainer for our company. So that's a, a high level presentation. Now, one of the challenges with a presentation like this is the people listening, the audience, there could be some people from smaller companies, some people from larger companies, 
And it's really difficult in a one-size-fits-all to make this presentation. So I think one of the, the best ways that you'll get value out of the experience and the background that we've had is to really get in there and ask some questions. So Actually, that, Jack, that Jack I've got a question for you, if I could jump in for a second. Sure. Yeah, you mentioned uh, your, your Google products results increase. I just were, wondered, you know, for Bing or for other site comparisons, uh, other uh, type of uh, product comparison sites or other types of search engines, I mean, we're always so focused on Google. Google is, you know, the 800-pound gorilla. But do you have any data about how Bing or, or anything else, uh, if, if that improved or if that went down? Improved from a, from a net... A, a, a search per well there, there's really no correlation so in the case of Bing it's actually stayed relatively flat um, year over year and our shopping comparison next tag price grabber shopping.com biz rate all of those channels went down um, just because we we actually we made a concerted effort to continue to cut back so I was just curious if uh if Bing uh, can tell that you're using uh, the Google search engine and uh, that hurts uh, your inbound traffic from Bing or anything, <laughs> maybe, no, maybe no, that's just fine. a little conspiratorial on my part. <laughs> yeah, no, we're always looking for the ultimate conspiracy theory. Although once <laughs> Bing got rid of their, their cash back, um, they became uh, less important to us because it, Bing in any iteration, whether going back to MSN or even before that, has never really been a substantial part of our traffic or our revenue. But we haven't, we haven't seen any, and uh, I'm an ultimate conspiracy theorist, and I haven't seen any negative reaction um, from, from the implementation that we've done. All right, thanks, Jack. I, yeah, I think that's a great point uh, to jump in. I actually have some questions coming in from the audience um, about various things. I want to just start with um, with some of the ones that have come in uh, first, uh, we have a couple people asking about uh, this whole thing of a perpetual shopping cart. Some people are unfamiliar with the term. Um, other people want to hear it explained. Do you? Do either of you have any perspective on that? I could jump in real quick, and Jack, uh, feel free to add anything if you'd like. A uh, perpetual shopping cart. They come in a lot of different flavors, and they're not all created equally. But from our research, the data is limited, but it appears that cars that ride along with the shopper as they move through the site, they have a significant impact on conversion. So if you're not familiar with these, they vary by type, but you know, some simply show a dollar amount that changes dynamically with purchases, you know, some around the top or the bottom or the side of the screen as you're navigating the site. Others might have other uh, details like product details, thumbnails of images, estimated shipping costs, uh, recommended accessories or related products, and that, that's what we mean by perpetual shopping cart. And from our research, we found that 38% of our sample employ some version of that perpetual shopping cart, uh, but the vast majority fall into a much simpler shopping cart that the kind uh, you're normally used to, which essentially just has some cookies and, and uh, uh, you go back to it every time you add a product. And that has somewhat of a positive effect, but much lesser effect than the enhanced versions that ride along with you. Jack, did you have any perspective? Or I have other questions for you, too. Well, so we, we just implemented um, a version of a perpetual shopping cart in October with our redesign. And I haven't seen, um, it, it's still a little bit too early for me to tell um, what it's done from a conversion standpoint, but I know that it's just easier for the user. You just, you constantly know what you've already added, what you have, and you've got an easy way to navigate there as opposed to the way that we used to do it. I have another question for you, Jack. Uh, someone from the audience wants to know, how, mu how much of a challenge is it for e-tailers to get fully attributed product data to support on-site faceted search? All right, so can you say that question again? That's sure, out. of course. Is it challenging, essentially, to get fully attributed product data to support kind of uh, ba basically building out your search and making it and improving it? Um, no, it's actually not. So in Google Analytics, Again, we've tried all sorts of different analytics programs. The only one we haven't tried is Core Metrics. And it's, it's pretty straightforward to be able to see your revenue by search. Now, as far as going down to the level of what attributions or what facets people clicked on, um, I just don't have the analytics team to get that low level. Although I do know other 
e-commerce sites and other e-commerce peers who do that. Um, but from our perspective, my analytics group is two people. So we just, there's not enough time in the day to do that. So really what you'd be looking at is a conversion funnel and then trying to figure out what's the best way or what are the best facets or what are the best um, sub-searches that lead to, to uh, conversion. But it wouldn't, the data is there, um, at least in Google Analytics. So I don't think it would be all that difficult, but it's something that we don't do right now. We look at it in a more holistic way. Sure, and shifting gears a little bit, there's another question that's come in about privacy. Are there any concerns about Google having access to customer information from a privacy perspective? So they don't have access to any customer information. Um, there's no personal information sent back and forth. When a customer comes to our site, they submit a query, and we're submitting, so if they search for the word Brytax, there's absolutely no user information whatsoever being sent. All we're sending to Google is the word Brytax, and then they return a result set. So they, they have no idea who the individual is from a cookie or from any other perspective. Okay. And what about landing pages? How does Google handle landing pages uh, as far as search goes? Do you have any uh, comments on that? Well, you can, you can make all sorts of different custom landing pages. So one that I have my, work, my group working on right now is if somebody searches for the word, and this is just a small example, but if they search for the word about us, right now it's kind of a funky result. And what that should really do is pull up the about us.html page. So um, there's plenty of protocols that you can handle custom landing pages, especially if you've got, um, you know, if you were to search for store locations or if you were to search for customer service or if you have proprietary brands or you want to do uh, proprietary marketing, you can, you can do a correlation between search word and custom landing pages. It's pretty straightforward. Great, and I just want to ask you one more question, Jack, before I turn it over to you, Dan, to give a, a little bit more of your presentation. Um, overall, has your company spent more money on technology in the past few years, year over year? Um, well, I'm going to break that up into two parts. So from the standpoint of CapEx dollars and hardware and software, we're actually spending less because we're in the process of completely moving over um, our entire site to the cloud. So in the end, my cost to continue to buy hardware and bandwidth will be less expensive in the cloud. Although in the last three years, I have hired um, another senior level developer. So from, a, from an HR standpoint, we've increased our spend, but from a hardware and CapEx standpoint, we've, we've, it's probably almost a wash from what we've saved versus what we've spent in addition. So I, I would have to say that that's a push right now. We're probably at about the same, we're right around the same budget. Sure, okay, great. Well, I'm gonna turn it back over to you, Dan, because I know you have a few more slides to take us through and uh, some, some studies to talk about with Jack. So I'm just going to turn it over to you. Okay, great, thanks, Kelly. Uh, we wanted to do, in the time we had remaining, is look at marketing Sherpas, uh, look through our members library and look through some case studies and past reporting we did and, and find some creative practices that you might find helpful. At marketing Sherpa, we put out newsletters on lots of different marketing related topics. One of them is consumer marketing. Uh, you can go to marketingsherpa.com and sign up for all the different newsletters for free actually. And uh, we also have a members library that has a database of all of these uh, case studies and how-to articles we've done going back years and years and years. So I went into and, and seen what our uh, reporting team did, and I came up with about five creative practices I thought might be helpful for you, and we're going to go through these one by one. Uh, search box optimization is first. Search results as homepage redesign catalyst. I thought this was really interesting. This isn't how to optimize your search per se, but it's how to use your on-site search data in a very clever way. Uh, the, also, the accessibility of popular items, that's a hot topic, the importance of being organized. And then just some test ideas we're going to give you at the end. Uh, we'll see, we have some questions coming through about what should you, how should you be displaying uh, search results. So let's jump into a first case study here. This case study I'm going to go through in a more detailed manner than some of the others. But basically, uh, the marketer was called Black Forest Decor. And they were a mail order catalog and internet business that had a home decor and lighting products. 
Now we're seeking to optimize our on-site search box. Basically, uh, they were just looking for some simple tweaks and wanted to know if they needed a bigger box. It reminds me of the, uh, uh, I think it was a, a Chalupa commercial for Taco Bell, and there was this cute little dog, and he always said, uh, I think we need a bigger box. So All right, let's jump into it. This is essentially what they had before. You can see it was in the upper right. Uh, it's pretty unemphasized. You can't see it that well search function. Let's look at the after and see what they did here. Okay, They added, uh, first of all, they increased the size of the box. You can see this is clearly a much bigger box. The previous box was 20 by 18 pixel rectangle, including 209 pixels for the white keyword fill-in field right there. They made it a 30 by 18 pixel rectangle, including 359 pixels for the white keyword fill-in field right there. Also, they put it right in the middle of the page, smack dab in the middle, they centered it. They also changed the text. If you, if you remember before, the text said go, and they changed it to find. So after all, when you think about why your customers are going to that box, and it might seem like a very minor change, but if you change that word to tie into what their motivations are, they want to find something. They're not seeking to go anywhere. So that's why they made that change. And lastly, to get the viewer's attention, they added color to the box. You'll notice there's dark green in the bold font for the box's outline in the word search. There's dark red in the bold font for the find button. There's off-white in the small rectangle surrounding the find button to make it more three-dimensional. Three and there's you know, white itself for the search field, which is pretty traditional. So let's take, you can take a look. I know before I went through that before pretty quickly, but you can see the before and after right there on the same screen to get a real sense for how it's bigger, how it was centered, and how they emphasize a lot more. So let's take a look at some of the results that they got from that. There was an 84% increase in average revenue per customer using that search, 20% left in conversions for people using on-site search, and a 34% increase in the website conversion rate. And Jason Dupu, I don't know sure if I pronounced that right, the president of Black Forest Decor, uh, he said the significant increase in raw searches was an other benefit because it also gave us more options for keyword terms to consider for our SEM campaigns, and that part of the redesign didn't take a whole lot of work. So that's something else to consider, that not only did they get that increase in conversion and revenue, but by using that data that they got from people typing in more searches, you know, more searches is more data, and that gave them a chance to improve their search engine marketing as well. So, uh, Jack, I know we talked about this previously. You, you've uh, made some similar changes, like I believe centering the box, and you found some good results. Yeah, it centered the box and increased the size by probably 30%. And, and um, we don't necessarily use the leads for SEM. We use it for SEO, but we found that the increase in searches, that's exactly right on. I mean, we've seen a big increase in conversion. We've seen a big increase in people using it. Um, and what was kind of an interesting correlation is that we've almost doubled the amount of searches and cut the time that people are searching in half by having a more efficient search. So um, I think it's a great mining tool. Okay, you know, great. I wanted to jump in. I wanted to jump sure. in there because, um, you know, I think that perhaps this could essentially be something that. Uh, people might overlook uh, because it seems so simple, but um, Jack, do you think that uh, something like this just kind of reposition your search bar, making it bigger, do you think that people need to pay more attention to that, or what are, what are some other things that people need to pay more attention to that perhaps um, are being overlooked? Well, that is the easiest thing to do. If you don't take anything away from that, I think that that's the one go-do that wouldn't cost anybody anything, is you need to make your search bar big and prominent. And we even experimented with, with different keywords that are pre-populated in there. So right now we kind of have a basic set, but we used to have something in there, type your search here with an exclamation point. So I think that, that uh, that's definitely a big takeaway. And the other is you really need to look at your top searches and really make sure that the pages are merchandised right and that you've got that the products are showing up the right way because all too often, I think it's easy, especially as our catalogs get big, not to put the right attributes into your products. So there's work that everybody on this call can do that won't cost a lot of money to really make your search more effective. So it would be focus on attributes and make sure that your results look right and make that search box bigger. And then um, what, what Dan was just saying is mine the data. It's just, it's, it's amazing. Um, for a period of time, and we've kind of been in and out, and we're, we're trying to, to um, do A-B or uh, optimization tests on it. We used to take our top 8 to 10 keywords, top search keywords, and make them permanent links on our homepage. 
So we do that to some extent now with our brands. So the top search brands have a position on our, the left-hand side of our homepage now. But there's a lot of data in there. And we all spend tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of dollars a year in SEM work. You should at least take the value of what you're seeing from your site and trying to repurpose that. Excellent. Okay. Thanks, Jack. And, and that, um, and when you're talking about learning from your search, uh, that's the next thing I want to jump in. This is another case study from the Marketing Sherpa Members Library. This is just a one slide one is going to go through it quickly. But in this case, they use those search results uh, as a catalyst to help them redesign their homepage better. Basically, they looked at their search logs to see what people were searching for the most. And they wanted to help them eliminate having to do that search step and put a link on the home navigation. So you see that term list across the top, that goes through the lowest hanging fruit. And so this might seem counterintuitive at first, right? We're talking about on-site search. The idea is to make on-site search better. But again, it's thinking about why are people coming to your homepage? Why are they using that search box? They don't want to search. They want to find something. And so what this bank did, it was very clever. They just tried to make it as easy as possible to find. And so one of their KPIs was to actually reduce the number of searches. Because if people weren't searching, it means they're more likely finding what they're already looking for. So to help them find so it more easily, Sure. Yeah, I just have one point on that. So in our old search, that was actually one of the factors that told us that we needed to do something because our, our average search was five searches. So that was an indication to us that they weren't finding what they needed quick enough, and that was kind of a red flag. So your point there that, that the concept is to try to mitigate the number of searches, I think it's spot on. Thank you. Yeah, and again, it's always, and in everything we try to do here uh, through our marketing experiments research as well, it's tying into the motivations of the user, not tying into, it's so easy, and I know we've all done this, anyone who's had a career in marketing, is to tie into what we want to say, what we want to say as a marketer, is what we want to put out there. We always have to remember, we want to have to tie into what our audience wants to hear. And that might seem like a subtle difference, but again, the difference between a search button or a go button and a find button at the, at the very base level is understanding why your customers are on that page. So let's take a look at a few of the, the changes they made. I'm sure uh, this might apply to a lot of sites as well. If you look at those, those tabs across the top, or what they call navigation blocks, they separated them by types of use. They found the types of people that were coming to their site and uh, decided that to make it easier for them to find what they're looking for, for example, in this case, uh, a commercial uh, enterprise looking for a bank is likely looking for something very different than a person is. And so a challenge we found many marketers have is what do you put on your homepage? You know, there's a lot of times some political fights over what should be on a homepage of a company that offers many different options. In this case, this retail bank is also a commercial bank. And so if your homepage was only focused on personal banking, you know, you might turn off some commercial bankers. But again, they have, uh, by putting that tab across the top, they help tie in commercial bankers can go right to that tab. And the same for small business. So while you can have that commercial tab, you know, you can alienate some small businesses because businesses could be many different sizes. So they made sure they broke out those tabs uh, based on their main traffic. The other thing they did is, again, with that terminology, they, they looked at what terms people were searching for, right? So here are some basic examples. They used to have loans as one of the links across the top of their page. They changed it to borrowing because people were searching for borrowing. That was a term that people were looking for. Uh, also, uh, these have locations, they changed it to branches. Those might seem minor, but again, you're tying into the motivations of what people are looking for. And this might be some, this for a bank, those, those terms are minorly different, but think of yourself too, if you're a retailer uh, and you're selling a particularly hot product, uh, let's say skateboards or snowboards or something like that, where there's a lot of slang. You also have to think about what type of slang or what type of different ways your audience might be thinking of the products they're searching for as opposed to just only the, the set uh, specific definitions in your industry. Um, this also is nice because, sure, go on, Jack. Uh, I was just going to jump in on that point. So through our search data, we actually redefined, we used to have a tab called nursery. And in the industry, that means kind of cribs and baby furniture and layettes. And the reality was that our users were searching for cribs and furniture. So that's why we renamed our category. And even in the word car seats, we used to have it as car seat as one word. And all of our searches were car space seats. So we renamed our category car space seat. And that not only helped us or helped our customers understand more quickly what it was, but that also really helped us from a natural standpoint, a natural search. 
You know, Jack, that's actually yeah. um, a good point for me to ask. Uh, one of our audience members has said, this might be a, a simple question, but how can we see the list of search keywords in our customer, that our customers are using to search on our website? It's, it's a simple question, but people want to know. Well, you know, it, it really depends on, on what you're using. So when we had our own internal developed search, we had reports that came out and gave us frequency of search by day, by month, by hour, um, and then we we started to write reports that would try to correlate or extrapolate out the misspelling. So if the word Britex was one of the top search terms, we would, we tried to, through our own intelligence, draw any misspellings of that word up into that. Um, in Google Analytics right now, we get great reports and we can see in detail what words are getting searched and then you can drive deeper. So it depends on what search application you're using right now and what analytics package you're using. But that, that should be, um, in any big commercial analytics package, a pretty straightforward uh, report that you can get. And as a follow-up to that, I, I also have another really great question. Uh, how well does Google handle relevancy in plurals? So for instance, a search for ball should bring back toy balls, not balloons, which contains the word ball. Um, just as an example, do you have any any work with your product data to to make this work? Do you have to sort of um, how do, how do you deal with this? So we actually had a um, a pretty interesting problem. We had some people searching for the word tramp, T R A M P, and it was just short for trampoline. So when <laughs> initially when it when and I know it kind of sounds funny, um, although. Um, when I saw the word tramp and that it wasn't getting any results, I talked to my developers and they went one step further to send another request to Google. So you know in Google when you see a misspelling, it gives you recommendations. So what we did was we just resent that search and Google sent back a result that said, did you mean trampoline? Go. And they only send stuff back that's relevant to your particular products. So in the case of searching for ball, if there are no balls on your site and you want the word balloon, as long as you have balloons on your site, you should be able to return the, the results set balloons for the word for the search ball. Great. And then you can put you can put other filters on there. So if you want to direct somebody um, differently, you can you can do it. And and this all happens in in milliseconds. It's just amazing. We were able to do get the initial search send back another request, and, and deliver results in under a second. Wow. Dan, I know you had a, a few other things to talk about with Jack, so I'll, I'll kick it back over to you. Yeah, thanks. So let me finish up uh, telling what happened with this case study here. But So in the end, uh, what they were able to do is they went, before the site re revamped, the average site visitor for this uh, site, they use the search box one and a half times during a session. That's considered fairly low by industry standards, but still, since the revamp, that number lowered to 1.2 se searches per average session. And plus, the items being searched for are now less likely to be links already ready available on the navigation, which, again, those are their most important links that, where people are starting to go from there. Another thing that happened is, uh, for example, let's take the keyword careers. Um, now that careers has been added to the top horizontal bar, 80% fewer searches look for jobs the look for the jobs page and traffic to the jobs page has risen by 25 percent so you know again it's how we look at things we think of as search as the way people are going to find things that's the only way they're going to find them but you can see like for example for this keyword while searches are down traffic is up because they made it easier for people to find um, let's can jump on now to the next case study uh, talking about search itself making popular items uh, more accessible so uh, with this uh, retailer was, it was American Bridal uh, they wanted to to deliver search results based on popularity. So they programmed the search tool to record past site searches and click-throughs and use that information to deliver results based on popularity. Code was also included to allow misspellings to be interpreted, something that Jack was talking about, so users wouldn't see zero results. That's the absolute worst thing uh, to have if, you, if someone's searching for something and you just return, sorry, we have nothing. So what do you think is going to happen at that point in a, an era where they can easily bounce and look at your 10 or 20 competitors? I don't think they're going to stick around and try to guess, okay, uh, if I'm, you know, if I search Tramp, if I, uh, you know, I search Tramp and you just, you know, if you don't know it's trampoline and someone else does, especially since so many sites have uh, people, with the way they search, they have many different tabs open. So they might search Tramp on your site, find nothing. 
uh, search trampoline on the next tab, find trampoline, and, and they'll likely go there. So that's something to keep in mind. But anyway, popular search categories also appeared on the page, letting users click to see the most viewed products arranged alphabetically. And you can see on the bottom there how the top 21 product categories are listed below the other features. So that underscores the strategy they had of making the most popular items as accessible as possible. By doing this, this was only one of the, the many things I did. It was a, it's a very long case study with a, a lot of uh, features to it. But um, basically, they were the revenue per visitor using the search box increased $13.52 on average, up from $4.99 per visitor. Now, that, was, that means that if 100 people were using the search box, no matter how many purchases, uh, they saw $1,352 in sales. That wasn't 100 people buying. So I think that's a pretty impressive example of showing how important it is when people search, before we talked about presenting the information so when people land on the page they can easily find it, now we're talking about presenting the information so when people search it's displayed in a way where people can most easily find the most popular items which are ones that they're most likely interested in. Uh, Jack, do you have any experience with that? Uh, it, again, this goes back to the, the results of, of putting some search words onto our home page. So, um, we found that that's effective, although it's been in and out, and we're continuing to test it, but it all makes sense. Okay. Uh, I want to jump on to the next point about how important organization is. So this is something we, we touched on before about when people land on a home page, making sure they're able to easily find where they want to go. Uh, what we found is the channels for the four or five groups that are most important uh, that represent 80% of your traffic, that's likely what you want to have on your home page. It's going to vary based on your specific company, but likely they're, they're the four or five groups that represent most of your traffic. It's kind of that 80-20 rule, you know, where, where you might have a hundred different uh, groups or personas that you can separate your traffic into, uh, but it might be likely that, you know, 95 or 96 of those personas represent a very small amount of traffic, and there are four or five that are really key. So you can see this example from USA.gov. Uh, we're all familiar with the federal government. I thought this was a good example. We all, we're all essentially uh, uh, consumers of it. So you can see uh, they broke it down by citizens, businesses or nonprofits, federal employees, government to government, or visitors. And so that was clearly the, the people most likely to visit this site. And another reason this is important is because in our marketing experiments research, we found that people really only give your site a split second once they land on it. Is we're talking about a home page here to determine what they're going to do next. So if they're going to your home page, you know, they're not going to take the time to scroll through and figure out exactly how they need to get where they want to go. Uh, that's a challenge because us marketers, when we think about a home site, a home page, we likely have it memorized. We likely have every link, every button, every, every drop-down menu, every feature memorized. And so for us, it's very easy to navigate through that home page because we live and breathe it. We work on it eight hours a day, every day. We have to remember that when people land on that homepage, a lot of them are landing on it fresh. And they might have come from something totally different. They might have come from a search box on Google. They might have come from an ad you've placed. They might have just seen your name on a stadium and been interested in who you are. Well, there's a bit of a disconnect from when they think about your company and type it in to then when they land on your page. And if you don't make it as easy as possible for them to find out where they want to go, there's a high likelihood they're going to bounce. Let's talk about another easy way to organize. When we saw those search results, uh, we previously saw the importance of making uh, the most popular search results easy to find. Another thing to think about is refining those search results. So in this case, this is, I believe, nature.com. And what they did is, you can see in the upper right there, they refined the search results for, broader, uh, for broad terms. So when someone searched nanotechnology, there was a lot of different things that uh, they could then choose nanotechnology under a lot of different uh, categories. And under it, they also broke the list down by topic. So you can see they said find nanotechnology in these subjects. So you know you might not know if the searcher meant, for example, in this nanotechnology example, if they were searching for some cancer-related nanotechnology thing. I, I have no idea about nanotechnology, so I can't give a better example. Or some chemistry-related one. Uh, you're not going to know that. Your search isn't going to know that uh, intuitively. But what you can do is definitely break down uh, the subjects or the topics that are most related to what they're searching for so uh, people can still find what they're looking for. And this third example under Organize, I wanted to give a, a, a bad example as well because I know sometimes you sit in a webinar like this, you see uh, all these really good examples of high-performing marketers, and it's very inspiring, but it can also kind of deflate your balloon if, if you're not close enough to that. You know, everyone is not performing at that level. And so here's an example where you see uh, just some very common uh, basic mistakes, like a bad match between the search term and the data retrieved. If someone is searching for corporate management training and it's time to go on a low-carbon diet comes up, 
uh, they're probably not going to, and, and that has an, an 86%, as you see there, uh, uh, accuracy result. They're, they're probably likely just going to bounce from your site and not give it a second thought. And also, there's no context for any of these results, as we saw in the previous example, where let's say they're searching for something like human resources, one of the middle searches. That, that can relate to a lot of different topics. Again, you might not know what what intuitively your customer might be looking for, you certainly can give them some different options based on your site. And I know, Jack, you were talking before about how uh, you've tried to uh, organize uh, your search results and, and the way you set up your homepage. Yeah, so uh, as I kind of stated earlier in our presentation, we've got four major groups of, con of consumers, grandparents, new parents, gift givers, and friends and family. And everybody has a different uh, way they want to search, a different way that they want to see the site. And something that we have on, on the block for 2011 is to have tabs driven so that if you're a grandparent coming to our site, you can immediately click on a grandparent tab. And based off of buying behaviors and search results, we're going to make sure that it's merchandised to, be, to give the optimal results for what a grandparent wants. And it might be that you're a two-weekend-a-year grandparent and you need a small pack and play instead of a full-size crib. So when you go to our sleeping section of grandparents, we're not going to show big expensive cribs. We're going to show stuff that's more suited to your lifestyle. So I think that that was kind of spot on. And then from the standpoint of refinements, um, one of the benefits that we get with the site, with the search that we're using now, is we get the benefit of having expanded suggestions in the results. Um, and I think sometime during this year, we'll also get Google Instant probably added into this. So that will give an opportunity to really have people refine their searches quickly and try to give them the best experience possible. Okay, great. I'm going to jump to our, our one final uh, creative practice we wanted to arm you with today, and that is uh, giving you some ideas on how you should present your searches. Now, uh, I'm not going to present this and tell you that these are specific best practices, that any one of these works better than another one. Um, these are all practices that we've seen work well on different sites, and how well it's going to work on your site uh, varies depending on who your audience is and what your products are. So the best advice we can give you here is to just test it, try different things out, and see what works for you. But here's some, uh, to give you an idea, here's some ways you can test displaying your results. So first one is last in, first out. So for example, if you have your own inventory. Um, and you want to get rid of some of that, that older stock, especially if it's perishable in some sort of way, you might just uh, want to uh, change how you uh, display your search results. If it's perishable, you might want to put the perishable for stuff first. Uh, if you're just trying to move older inventory, you might want to put uh, the last in stuff first there. Uh, also, top sellers, something we looked at before, those products which historically sell best in a certain category. Now, hot products is another way of looking at it. Uh, what, what's if you can see which different products are trending at a certain time? Um, so, for example, if you sold uh, Super Bowl mugs or something like that, and uh, right after the Super Bowl, I'm sure those would be a hot seller, even if uh, they're not one of your top sellers overall. Uh, you know, the month of February would probably be a pretty hot seller. A lot of different factors can affect that as well. Um, your best margin products, that's got a great appeal there because <laughs> it'll make you the most money. But you also might want to think that um, that for some reasons, those might not necessarily be your top sellers or your hottest products. So people might just be looking at those as add-ons for one of your top products. And so they might not want to see that first. They might want to see something they're looking for first. Um, and that kind of goes with associated sales at the bottom, which I'll talk about in a minute. Uh, top rated products uh, is another way to display. And this is becoming more and more popular by having your site visitors, um, either through reviews or ratings on your site or by using a, a third-party plugin of some sort, um, if you rate those products the highest, there's uh, a bit of a bandwagon uh, approach with that because people shopping at your site will see that, that other consumers like them think it's a good product and they might be more likely to purchase it. Um, and associated sales, that's another way of doing it. And that will vary by the nature of the product and the manufacturer. So for example, if you sell MP3 players, uh, let's say you have, um, <laughs> I don't even know any other MP3 player than an iPod, but if you have an iPod up there first and you try to put headphones with it, uh, you might be a, a lot less likely to sell some high-quality headphones because everyone's seen the earbuds. They've become kind of iconic. They're, they're probably okay with them. But let's say you have some sort of generic MP3 player that, that's selling pretty cheaply. Well, they might be more worried then about the quality of the headphones and they might, might be more likely to have an associated sale. So again, that's just something you can test in how you display your search results. And what, what have you find, found along these lines, Jack, about how you display your search results? 
So I, I think merchandising has, has a big component, and this is really what you're getting into. And that was one of the most important parts. Um, we, we had our own internal recommendation engine, and one of the challenges that we had before we built some tools is that once there's a strong correlation between a particular crib and a particular mattress, it was hard to get another product up there um, to kind of break that correlation. So we spend a fair amount of time making sure that based on subcategory that we're making recommendations that are either apropos by time period, so sometimes there's sensitivity. So believe it or not, January and February are the biggest months of the year for crib sales. So we make sure that wherever possible and wherever contextually relevant that we're putting in either our best margin cribs or our top selling cribs. This will even be further refined in the future when we go through and break out our customers by different segments, so whether um, parent, grandparent. E everything else you have here, I think this, this, gets, this is the convergence of search and merchandising. And this is where you really need to, search is not necessarily marketing or technology, you really need to have your merchants in there. I can remember speaking with a former CMO of 800 Flowers, probably about five And during peak holiday times, they actually re-merchandised their search results almost hour by hour based on what they had in stock, what was their highest margin, and what was selling. So um, depending upon the size and scale of your organization and your traffic, you can get in and really make sure that this is a full company effort, or at least between merchandising and marketing, to deliver the most effective assortment of products to your customers. Excellent, Jack. And uh, I just wanted to uh, show one more slide, and then first of all, thank Kelly and Jack for having me on this uh, webinar, and just letting you know, uh, if you like the case studies and how-to articles you saw, we do this type of thing every week. Uh, we have a bi we have a uh, actually, uh, by uh, by monthly uh, consumer marketing newsletter, you can sign up for it at marketingsherpa.com slash newsletters. We also have weekly newsletters and email marketing and inbound marketing. Uh, we share our, our marketing charts every week. So you can go to marketingsherpa.com slash newsletters. There's a lot of free info we make available to marketers every week. Kelly? Yeah, great. If uh, Dan, if you can just advance uh, one more slide for us to give us uh, the final slide. Um, we're sort of out of time, but uh, I do have one more question that I wanted to try to get in. Um, someone had asked, what are some best practices when customers search for something that your company doesn't carry? So, for example, they get the prompt search not found. Jack, what do you think uh, is the best way to deal with something like this? I'll tell you, that, that, that's been a challenge for us. Um, so one way that we used to address it is if we see a high enough frequency of searches and it's related to our categories, we go out and buy. So for example, um, Baby Bjorn used to be the most popular soft front carrier in, the, in, in our space. But over the past couple of years, there have been two new brands that have popped up. So that's an example where we used searches for a product that we didn't carry to add into our merchandise. But let's say somebody comes in and starts searching for um, a video game, and we don't sell video games. We don't really have a good answer for that right now because we've looked at adding in, um, you know, different different third-party people want to put links out, and we could get paid for that. But I just we spend so much money getting people to our site that I just wasn't ready to just throw that in as a default and push people out someplace else. So I think probably the best advice is to evaluate all your not found results. And number one, make sure that you don't have products that already address that because they don't have the appropriate attributes. But then number two, let your merchants in on the loop and see if it's something that they can add. Because if you have a high, high enough frequency of searches for a particular product category or brand that you don't sell, maybe that's a good indication that you should start selling it. Great, and I just have one, one final question for you, Jack. Um, are there any stats regarding sorting data, either by price or alphabetically? Um, I, I don't. I don't have those right now. Um, but again, in in our in our analytics package, it's something that's pretty easy to get. But we, with with the amount of searches and the amount of full time people I have, or the limited amount of full time people I have, we don't really get that granular right now. 
Okay, great. Well, I just want to thank you all for joining us, especially uh, Jack and Dan for presenting all of that great information. And I also want to make one big correction. Uh, you guys were so gracious to use our slide templates with the ETEL logo, but we have a typo. Um, our event, ETEL West, takes place February 22nd to 25th, not to the 27th. So I just wanted to point that out for everyone who's still on the line. And also just remind everyone to follow our updates on the blog, uh, www.theetailblog.com, you can actually subscribe to email updates. And then, of course, Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn. We'd love for you to be a member and to follow our updates there. And finally, uh, if you're a retailer and you haven't registered for the show yet, um, you can register with the code WEBINAR to receive 20% off. So that's about it, guys. I wanted to just thank you one more time. And um, thanks a lot, Jack and Dan. Thank you, Take Kelly. Care.